remind you of something. In times of confusion, he's not. He is not confused. Hallelujah. I mean, he is the ancient of days. He is the ancient of days, and believe me, he's still got all of his faculties. He's not confused about anything. Hallelujah. What's amazing to me, even more than the fact that I know he's not confused, is that I know he's not moved. Huh? I mean, they've been sitting side by side. I don't know how it works up there. I don't know if they have to take a restroom break or, or what happens, you know. But they've been sitting up there side to side, side by side, uh, for thousands of years. Hmm? Probably just uh, assigning uh, angels uh, uh, things to do, maybe to go get them some chips and queso or, you know, <laughs> whatever strikes their fancy, huh? Rellenos. I better not start talking along these lines because it's, it's a long time till lunch for me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But he's got a life that he, that he paid for his children to have. And you know, I'm so honored to be a part of your lives and to know that you're in this house this morning, uh, not because you just know it's the thing to do, but because you know it's the place to be. Anytime we have an opportunity and uh, have been given and afforded the latitude uh, to meet together, then we should not let any pressure, uh, whether internal or external, keep us from the will of God. Because it is the will of God that we desire to do. Amen. And really the only way we can really experience the, the divine life that he has for us is if we honor his word. Amen? Amen. So I'm excited. I'm excited you're here this morning. Divine life is God's life. Your father only has one life. It's divine. It's supernatural. As we saw, it's glorious. There's no match to the life of God. It begins on the inside. It begins to create a stability on the inside of us. Glory to God. You can't put your finger on it. Yes. Huh? It begins, to, it begins to solidify and stabilize things that never were. It begins, to, it, it begins to show you that from the inside out, there is a life that can't be beat, that can't be rivaled on any level. It can't be bought. It's the divine life. It's supernatural. It's received and walked in by faith. It's the way it has to be done. Faith that, that takes all of its evidence from the Word of God. Hallelujah. Huh? The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. That means the Word of God is the substance of things that people hope for. And then it goes on to say that it is the evidence of things not seen. What we see in the Word is the evidence of things the way God wants them to be. Hallelujah. That's the divine life. Praise God. Yes. Hallelujah. We can get to the point where we actually believe that God's Word is God's Word. Yes, right. And that it belongs to us every bit as much as if we were sitting right next to Him. Yes. Which, in fact, the Word says that that's where He sees us. Seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But what's our fight? Well, it's the faith fight. It's the, it's the fight that says and does what the Word says in the face of ad, adverse circumstances and our adversary and people around us who don't get it. That's the fight. Yeah, that's, right. that's the fight. The fight is continuing to believe God's Word Embracing it and doing it, even in the face of ridicule, persecution, whatever it might be. Honestly, with a smile on your face. Unwilling to hate those that don't know what you know. Unwilling, unwilling to allow the opinions of man to keep you from focusing 
on what your God says belongs to you. That's right. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's what, that's what the divine life is all about. It's about looking past those things that you see into those things that are eternal, into those things that can become a part of your life experientially, but only when you look past the things that are trying to keep you from the divine life. Faith, that's what faith is all about. That's what faith is all about. I mean, it, it, it's, actually, it's actually putting the word in such a place of prominence that it becomes your reality. Hallelujah. Glory to God. No wonder people don't get it. You know, you've got to on purpose believe the word of God. You can't, you can't wait for a sign. Hmm? You can't wait for a sign. You've got to see the word as the evidence of what belongs to you. Hallelujah. In John 10, 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Listen, the thief, if you've got a handout, the thief doesn't care who he steals from, the saved or the lost. The enemy is no respecter of persons. He's a thief. Hmm? He's a destroyer. He's a killer. He's a murderer. He doesn't care whether you're born again or not born again. He's after the word of God. He's not trying to get to you before you die. He's trying to steal the word from you. So you do die. If not physically, emotionally, and relationally, all he wants you to do is be miserable. But he doesn't care about your name or your gender. All he cares about is stealing the word of God. Because what did Jesus say? I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So let's just think about this for a moment. The enemy's not just after the church. He's not just after church folk. He's not just after born-again believers. He's after the Word of God. If you don't have it, he's trying to keep you from it. If you do have it, he's trying to steal it from you. He's no respecter of persons. So let's don't ever from this moment on look at ourselves as persecuted or as those that don't know what to expect. Because I'll guarantee you there's plenty of people tormented today that don't know Jesus and have been for years and decades. Tormented. Their lives are tormented. And they don't know Jesus. The enemy is endeavoring to, to keep them bound. And he's interested in putting you back in bondage yourself. That's why even on the, um, I believe on my ministry letterhead, uh, there's a, a statement underneath it why, why I believe I even should make a difference because there's more. There's always more. There's always more. And if you actually believe there's always more, you'll always be seeking more. You'll always be seeking more. If you've reached a plateau or somebody's convinced you that there isn't any more, then there's a chance you may slow down, you may give up, you may faint, but there's always more. There's always more. Acts 26, 12 through 18, uh, you know, the uh, great man of God, uh, uh, Paul. Uh, I want to read this. I'm going to read it out of the message, Acts 26, verses 12 through 18. Paul speaking, he said, one day on my way to Damascus, armed as always with papers from the high priests authorizing my action, right in the middle of the, of the day, a blaze of light, light shining, light outshining the sun, poured out of the sky on me and my companions. O oh, king, it was so bright, we fell flat on our faces. Then I heard a voice in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why are, you, why are you out to get me? Why do you insist on going against the grain? I said, who are you, master? The voice answered, 
I am Jesus, the one you're hunting down like an animal. But now, up on your feet, I have a job for you. I've handpicked you to be a servant and witness to what's happened today and to what I'm going to show you. He said, I'm sending you off to open the eyes of the outsiders. That would be anybody that wasn't a Jew. So they can see the difference between dark and light and choose light. See the difference between Satan and God and choose God. I'm sending you off to present my offer of sins forgiven and a place in the family, inviting them into the company of those who begin real living by believing in me. Wow. Who would have ever thought Saul would have been picked? Well, who would have ever thought you would have been picked? I mean, there are probably people, I probably wouldn't have to, I probably wouldn't have to be on very many people who have known you, maybe in your growing up years or in your messing around years, huh? That would have a lot of trouble wondering how you ever got picked to be in the family of God. Well, the truth is everybody needs to know that everybody's been picked. Everybody's been picked. But as he said here a couple of times, when you're exposed to the fact that you're picked, you got to choose. You got to choose. You're going to go with what he said. Amen. Hallelujah. So here's Saul. Jesus made it very clear to him. Hey, listen, it's me. It's me that you're chasing down. It's what I have to offer that you're trying to steal from people. Hmm? This is what's happening. This is personal, Jesus said. But he said, listen, here's the deal. I'm going to use you to proclaim who I am and what I have to offer. So that people will actually be able to see that I can start on the bottom and create something that's not only divine, but supernatural. And honestly, this is why we preach the gospel. This is why we preach the gospel. You know, this simple call, I mean, it, it, was, it looked pretty dramatic, but this simple call that, uh, that the master used, that the Lord Jesus used to... Uh, uh, to reach uh, to reach Saul uh, is exactly what he sent him to do, and exactly what we've been sent to do to preach the gospel. In Mark sixteen fifteen and sixteen, you know this is a good time to take your eyes off of you, take your eyes off of uh, your four and no more, and your needs. And I know most of you are not like that at all, but in the event somebody's watching us that's like that. It's time for you to take your eyes off of you and your four and no more and realize that our assignment as the children of God is to preach the gospel, is to let people know that the lost don't have to remain in that condition. And this particular time, it makes me want to be louder and prouder in a good way of him and his assignment, knowing that really... Uh, people embracing him is, is honestly, it's the main thing. Yes. It's what really, really, really matters. Right. So Mark 16, 15 and 16, King James says, and he said unto them, his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're going to look at some definitions here in a minute. He that believes and is baptized and that's baptized into the body. That's not water baptized. You don't have to get water baptized uh, to be born again. You get water baptized to reflect having been baptized into the body of Christ. Okay? So, you know, those folks that say, you know, if you're not water baptized, you're going to hell. Then, you know, I guess thank God for the special dispensation of the, uh, of the, man, uh, uh, the man on the cross that the Lord Jesus forgave. He obviously didn't have time to get that handled. And uh, there can be other situations also, but anytime, anytime somebody tries to make something legalistic out of being born again, they've missed how you get born again. Yes. Amen. Right. Being born again is about believing personally from your heart and confessing from your personal lips 
the Lord Jesus. That's how you get born again. Amen. Hallelujah. So anyway, he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. In other words, there's a responsibility. Being born again, there's a condition to being born again, to be to, to being saved. Amen? Hallelujah. Amen. I'll say it for you. The definition of gospel, it is the proclamation of the grace of God. It is the proclamation of the grace of God available through the final sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, who obviously is grace himself. It's the proclamation of the grace of God. Why do we know that? Because the Bible says it's by grace, by Jesus, you are saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, by grace. God just said, I'm going to make a way for these people. And he looked over at Jesus and said, you're going to be it. You're going to be it. You're going to be the vehicle I use to bring people into our family. Gospel again, the proclamation of the grace of God available through the final sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. We are not called to preach or focus on our civil or human rights, but rather mankind's rights to become and live as the children of God. You know, most people in our world don't have any civil rights rights. Many of them are, are treated not humanely at all. And they are just as much a part of the world as we are. So we must remember those of us who were fortunate enough to have been born here or to now live here and are the, under the umbrella of... Uh, opportunities that don't exist in most nations, we've got to realize that that is not what we count on. We count on him. And the moment we begin to think that we can pressure a system to produce more than what he's already paid for, we're wasting good oxygen. We could be doing something of eternal value. Amen. So, you know, the reason situations are the way they are today with people who are born again is they don't know what belongs to them as the children of God. Hmm? Most of them don't have enough of, of what, what they should have in them to be able to stand in this day without the assistance of the world. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Jesus paid a perfect price yeah. so that we could overcome spirit, yes. soul, yes. body, mind, will, and emotions without any need for anything or any body but him. That's right. And the moment we begin to entertain what's happening to us or what's happening to the world, we are missing what he's done for us. We are elevating what's been defeated instead of taking advantage of being a victor in him in this life. That's the good news. The good news is that the poor don't have to be poor anymore. The good news is that the sick don't have to be sick anymore. The good news, those who are diseased with drama and issues can have a peace that passes understanding. But if you're fighting for what the world has to offer, you'll never have what he's already freely given you. That's why not only 
should we be taking advantage of whatever additional time we might have right now? From this moment forward, we shouldn't forget that this is not the end of the things that we're seeing. There may be a lull after this storm, but there are clouds on the horizon. But you know what? Our God reigns. He's got a divine life for his kids. And when it becomes bigger in your heart and your mouth, huh, than the noise and the voices that you're hearing from the outside, you're going to remain crippled. You're going to remain crippled, and you're not going to be able to enjoy this divine life that he has for you. So we're not called to preach or focus on our civil or human rights, but rather mankind's rights, those around us who've never embraced what God has done for them. When you promote or trust in your natural rights more than your rights as a child of God, you will end up missing the freedom you've been given through Jesus. And listen, there's more people on that road. Hmm? Remember, Jesus said that himself. You know, gosh, dog, you know, you'd think we'd pay attention to what Jesus said. Huh? The gate that's open to the divine life is narrow. The Word of God even says that there's few that find it. That it's pressure-packed. Why is it? It's not pressure-packed because the route is pressure-packed. It's pressure packed because there's pressure to not take it. The pressure is not to take it because the world's way looks easier. The Bible says many that find that path. Many, there's a lot of people on the road to destruction. You find Christians on the road to destruction. Not eternal destruction. I just said they're Christians. But a life that's it pales in comparison to what he has. That means you gotta, you got you to put up with the pressure and you say, oh, I don't care, you can say whatever you want to say. You can call me, you can call me whatever you want to call me. Yeah. I've been called probably worse things than you can call me, maybe. <laughs> I know today a lot of people are calling a lot of people stuff that you wouldn't think they ought to call them. And I'm talking about Christian people. I'm talking about Christian people calling Christian people stuff. But hey, that's the pressure. But the bottom line is the life is in him. And so no matter how much pressure that is, when I get on that path that leads to life, then every step I take is going to make life better. Amen? Amen? And you know, the better it gets, the easier it is to just not be moved by those things around you. You know, I believe that's a position that Paul that Paul got uh, uh, that that Paul got into. I mean, he'd put up with so much. Plus, the fact he had abandoned he had he had abandoned his, his himself. He had no longer uh, looked. I mean, and here was a man that was lauded and applauded and honored and everything. I mean, this guy was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I mean, he was a uh, he knew the law. He was a man. I mean, I'm gonna tell you, this guy went from being the man to being the man looked for. But that, none of that stuff moved him. Hallelujah. We should have seen it in Abraham. He considered not. You know, you got to get yourself in a position where you're not going to consider the obvious that's taken everybody else out. You're going to consider what they're obviously not seeing, and you're going to focus on that. And it makes no difference to you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, let's make this simple. No, we don't become rude and insensitive. That's where we have to maintain that love that we were given from him because that's the only way you can do it. I mean, you know, I used to be, you know, I used to just love to be able to, you know, kill him softly with my words. You know, that was a song, I think, you know. But I didn't do it softly. I just tried to be ugly and rude and insensitive and cutting, you know. I mean, you're going to say something ugly to me, I'm going to rip you a new one, you know. I'm going to use my words. But now that the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost, we've got to understand just like Jesus did, they don't know what they're doing. 
They don't know what they're talking about. We just need to just, we just need to go on. We just, when somebody says something, you just got to pretend they're not there. Yeah. That's right. Or if you can't avoid saying something, you say, you know, I'm sorry you feel like that. Yeah. And then you just keep going. Yeah. You don't create a dialogue with a hater. Yeah. You, don't, you don't create a dialogue with ignorance. Huh? You just consider it and you say, I'm sorry you feel that way. And you keep going. Even if they're yelling on your way out, you know. You just keep going. That's what you got to do. Yeah. Those are the days we live in. You know, somebody says, you know, somebody say, somebody would say something about, about us worshiping together. So we're going to worship together as absolutely as long as we're able to do that yes. legally. I'm not going, I'm not, I'm not going to be a defiant person. I'm not going to do that. I, I don't want, I don't want negative attention drawn to the reason why we're here. We're here because of faith. Yes. We're here because of that. We actually believe that God's word is bigger than anything that the enemy has to throw us. We, we actually believe that no plague can come nigh our dwelling and exist. We actually believe that you don't have to put a mask over your face to kill a germ. We actually believe that a germ doesn't stand a snowball's chance in a blast furnace of living around the people of God. That's what we actually believe. We actually believe that all of his promises are yes and amen. Yes and amen. We actually believe that God is true and everything else is a lie. If it is written, it is settled and it belongs to us. Glory to God. We actually believe that. We're here because we believe that. I'm here because I believe that. And if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be fit to stand before you. I wouldn't be fit to be here and call myself a pastor or an under shepherd. I wouldn't be fit to be here. I wouldn't be fit to hear if I didn't believe the word of God enough to do the word of God regardless of what the circumstances might be hallelujah hallelujah glory to God glory to God we're people of faith we're not waiting for things to fall in line so we'll feel good about doing what we do we do what we do because Jesus did it for us and he told us to take our place to occupy till he comes that doesn't we mean we hang out and get pushed around like a bunch of ignorant people no we're not going to get pushed around we're going to stand the ground of the word of God we're going to worship together as long as we can legally do it and then we'll do whatever we have to do that next day Hallelujah. We'll give him praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, let me regain here. Praise God. Did you all understand that? y'all understand that? I mean, that's fairly clear. You know, that's fairly clear. We're the people of God. I mean, if we're people of faith, then, then, then the Word of God is our, is our guidebook. It's our, uh, it's, it sets our course for us. It tells us what's available to us. I don't care if you don't ever experience it. You'll never come close. If you don't challenge your unbelief, if you don't challenge the religious systems of the world, if you're satisfied with that mediocre, freaking life, then you'll never, never know what it's like to watch in the free, walk in the freedom that God has for you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Does that make sense to us? Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. We think this is some little Mickey Mouse, huh? Six or seven, read a verse, huh? Well, I know, but you know, you know how bad this could be? Oh, bull tweeties. We should all, we should all consider how bad it would be 
to dishonor the one that bled out for us. Just think a moment about dishonoring what he did for us. Now, he won't, I'm, and I don't even need to take up for him, but I just want you to let, let you know that if it was me, huh, I'd think, what the flip? He would never say to his father, look at that. After all I've done for them, he'd never do that, but I'm doing it for him. <laughs> and he may reprimand me when I get there, but I'm going to say, master, you know, I may not say anything. I may just fall in a, you know, I just may fold up at his feet. I'm sure that's what will happen. But you and I ought to think like that. Because, you know, if we don't honor him like that, we won't honor the assignment either. We won't honor people around us if we don't learn to honor him with all our heart, all our mind, and all of our strength. All of the church stuff that many of us have been exposed to. And then people that are involved in those things, they want to use reason and sensory knowledge to tell you what you ought to be doing. No, what you ought to be doing is what the what the Word of God says. What you ought to be believing is what He said He paid for. Huh? Instead of listening to people trying to push you out of what belongs to you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Huh? Something going on in me. There's something going on in me. And if it's going on in me, it's going to be going on in some of you. Now it can be going on in all of you. Now we got to help each other, not get belligerent and ugly and rude and insensitive. I've already said that. I mean, I've said that. But I'm going to tell you, the Bible said, the Bible didn't say you'd be known by your sermons. It said it'd be known by your fruit. Hmm? And you know, a lot of fruit, a lot of fruit is in a presence. It's in a, uh, the way you carry yourself, the way things are working in your life. People can just see that. It's like, it's like Peter's shadow. Yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, Peter didn't even know his shadow was doing that until it started doing it. Yeah. You don't even know that your life is doing what it's doing yeah, <coughs> until your life is like his life. And then things begin to happen. People just know. You show up, they know they say, something's different. Yeah. Something's different in the room. And really, it doesn't even make any difference if they think it's coming from you. Care. What makes a difference is their heads turned. What is that? Or maybe why are they like that? Why? Why are they so stinking fired up about this? Well, have you ever thought they found out something you don't know yet? Because that's exactly what happens. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm glad I came to first service. We got to look at these things here. Definition for life is the word zoe, which is the absolute fullness of life, both essential, indispensable. You've got all these things written down, those of you that have the handout. So uh, I'm going to buzz through this. So both essential, indispensable, life or death, vital and ethical, moral, social, <coughs> behavioral, which belongs to God. Well, of course it does. It's his life. The life, real, genuine, active, vigorous, and devoted to God. Devoted to God. Let me just tell you something right now. Your life is never going to be the way it was three weeks ago or however long it's been. Never going to be the same. The same places used to vacation. They may not even be, <coughs> excuse me, up and running. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. A lot of things are going to change. Yeah. But you know what should change? Is your focus on him. Yes. Right. Even if everything continues the same, which it won't, your focus needs to change right now. A revelation of Jesus gives us access 
to God's life. Yeah, he's sitting there. We can't even comprehend what he went through. Not even worth talking about. You could watch the passion back to back to back to back to back to back for a month. And you'd have to have a revelation of what actually transpired. And that would never touch it the way it really was. But knowing him and receiving him as your savior, that's what gives you access to God's life. Second Peter 3.18, but grow in grace or grow in Jesus. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Growing in grace and knowledge is the way we access the life of the Father. We don't see life as a vacation. We don't see life as a, a new this or a new that or a new the other. Jesus already said, that's fine. Those things are fine. He said, but seeking me first is where the life is. Yeah, right. All the other things will be added to you. And even if you think that there's some things that you'd originally thought about that aren't added to you, it won't make a bit of difference to you. Because yeah. once you start pursuing him, all of a sudden you become strangely excited about what you have. Strangely content about what you have. Right. Huh? Strangely peaceful about what you have. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Growing in grace and knowledge is the way we access the life of the Father. Our joint heir, Jesus, holds the life of God for us. We're heirs with God. Yeah. Joint heirs with the Lord Jesus. Yeah. And then, and then we act like, you know, something like this comes along, and, and we think that's, that's bigger than what he's done. Well, as I said a couple of services ago, well, you know, you've got to be wise. You've got to be wise. Well, if you're going to be wise, then you're going to be a word guy or a word gal. You do what God's word says. That's, that's what makes you wise. huh? I mean, the word says that, that the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. But yet we put our credence in, in, the, in the world's ideas, don't we? I said, don't we? I said, didn't we? <laughs> didn't we used to? We put, our, we put our credence in what the world says. huh? They're telling people to jump today, and they haven't come down yet. They're just jumping. What do I do? How, where do I stand? Oh, there's your mark. Right <laughs> Holy... Lord Jesus. Now that's fine. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, rear in somebody in in Albertsons if I've got a line to stand on. I'm not gonna slip up behind them and scare the pee waddle out of them or anything. I'm gonna go ahead and stand back there on my place because I'm not looking. I'm not looking to be, you know, defiant or I'm not. But I mean, come stinking on. Where is this thing anyway, huh? Where is this thing? Why don't some of you Google the numbers? Google the numbers of those who have actually died and that percentage that's got the world doing a dance. Google the numbers. But honestly, we don't have to do any of that. Look at what the Word of God says. No weapon formed against you will prosper. No disease can come near your dwelling. I'll never leave you or forsake you. If he could never leave you or forsake you, I'm thinking, I'm thinking his presence ought to be enough to ward off any and everything that would try and jack with me. But how do you know he's there? Because you've embraced it. You vocalize it. You confess it. It's become real on the inside of you. You get to the point where when something comes up, say, he's right there. What's up? Thank you, Father. Appreciate you being there. Huh? All of a sudden, those things don't bother you anymore. Now, the people going to bother you. People going to bug you. 
but you're going to not be bothered. Hallelujah. Because what? Because you're standing on the word. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing on the promises of God. That's not just a dadgum song. Promises are, what is a promise? Man, you make somebody a promise, that's what you're fitting to do. And that's what he did. He promised us an abundant life. He promised us a long life. He promised us to, sh- he promised to show us all the benefits of salvation. My, my, my. Again, let me say it again. If I didn't see one of those promises, I'm going for it. Did you hear me? If I didn't see, if I don't see one of them, I'm still going for it. Hallelujah. Because I'm not in this for the promises. I'm in this for the promiser. I'm in for, for the one that did it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We'll finish this in a little bit. Uh, Again, here's a grace definition, the spiritual condition of, you've got it in your book, you can read it, fill in the blanks where it says spiritual and the gifts and attributes of God. The blanks are spiritual and gifts. This is what we're here to do. We're here to promote promote what God's word says. Hey, hey, listen, you know, people have to, people have to supernaturally uh, do the same thing we're doing. They have to begin to embrace him as their life. They have to begin to embrace him as their Savior and their Lord. Savior definition is deliverer and preserver. The Lord saves, which is delivering, and then he maintains or he preserves our salvation. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, if you can't get in by works, you don't stay in by works. Huh? If works don't save you, works don't keep you. The one that saves you keeps you. If you're saved, you're kept. Glory to God. You're born again by incorruptible seed. We got a great deal to offer people. And then if they'll begin to grow like many of us have, then these things that are meant to fear, and to, to, to cause fear and to create us to back off of what we believe, they'll be able to blow past those things. Hallelujah. But you got to come to the point. You got to come to the point where you're not going to allow yourself to be moved by people who aren't being moved. They're stuck in the same spot they've always been, and they're trying to tell you to stay there with them. Stay there with them. That's what they're trying to do. They want some buddies. They want some people around them. They don't want you going off in a, in a, in a, in a trail of light like Paul did. They don't want you doing that. They want you to stay back with them. They want you to huddle with them. They want you to be afraid with them. They want you to be in fear with them. And then they want you to begin to mock the word that you've embraced. And they want you to walk away from the things that he's done for you. That's what they're trying to do. All of them because of ignorance and because of allowing themselves to serve the God of this world instead of the God who is God. What is the Lord? Here's, here's a big key right here. What is the definition of Lord? Huh? One's owner. Now, you've got to see he's your owner on purpose because he's not going to strong arm you. He's not going to strong arm you. You've got you to defer to him. So I, 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 you, you, I mean, the Bible says that you were bought with a price. Sounds to me like that would make him your owner. But you have to defer to that ownership because he's not being loud and ugly like I am. Huh? He's going to speak to you this, with, a, with a still small voice. And you're going to have to yield to him that way. You yield to him. You humbly yield to him. You tell him, you're, you're, you're my owner. You're my possessor. You're my controller. You're my master. Only to the degree we yield to his lordship will we rule and reign in this life, spirit, soul, and body. Say, well, pastor, you know, you just, you know, you've just been at this so long. It doesn't make a difference how you've been at it, long you've been at it. It only takes a few seconds to make a decision. It only takes a few seconds to make a decision. And, you know, we continue to grow from that point on as we embrace the one. And I'm going to tell you what, you know, I believe that there's a lot of people that are going to experience what uh, uh, the Word of God calls a quick work. Not quick books, quick work. (laughs) A quick work. He's going to do things supernaturally in people's lives. 
Hallelujah. Remember the Bible says there'll be some that are uh, uh, first that'll be last, and there'll be some that'll be last that'll be first, huh? You know, this is just staying hungry the whole time. Glory to God. Yes. Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life, reign in life, reign in life, yes. reign in life yes. by one Jesus Christ. Reign in life, not be reigned on, not be ruled by, but reign in life by one Jesus Christ. To reign is to control and have the most influence. And you know both of those things? You're the one you need to control, and you're the one that needs to be influenced. We have to allow ourselves and demand of ourselves that we control ourselves and that we, we only allow what needs to influence us to influence us. And then the last statement, to reign in life is to reign in Zoe, which is the life of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's all stand with you.